الله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد حبيب رب العالمين وعلى آله وأصحابه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اللهم فقهنا في الدين وعلمنا التأويل وألهمنا رشدنا وهدينا يا أكرم الأكرمين اللهم إنا نسألك زيادة في الدين وصفاء اليقين وأن تجعلنا من أهل قربك ورضاك ومحبتك يا أكرم الأكرمين الحمد لله In our new class in which we are looking at the hashia of Imam al-Bajuri رحمه الله تعالى um, on Jawharat al-Tawheed um, which is a level 4 course in the science of Islamic beliefs of Ilm al-Aqaid this work has widely been considered one of the key study texts to consolidate the student's understanding of intermediate level Islamic beliefs. So whether it be at Al-Azhar or in Sham or Iraq or other lands where Ash'ari Aqeedah is studied, this text is frequently the final text that is studied in a madrasa curriculum of Islamic beliefs. And today, we are, we are by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, going to look at an introduction to the author and to the text, bithin lahi ta'ala. And this is very important, that when we begin anything, we should have a clear sense of the subject matter and the book, so that we enter into the subject with a clear sense of purpose, a clear sense of direction, and clarity on how to navigate. But also beyond that, we're going to look at how we can benefit from this text. Because this is not meant to be an introduction to Islamic beliefs. This is a level four text. The ideal preparation for this is that someone have studied previously. Right? That someone have studied at least two, if not three works. So that they've should have done something in level one of the Islamic studies curriculum, in level two of the Islamic studies curriculum, level three of the Islamic studies curriculum, and we have texts at, e at each of these levels by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Islamic studies curriculum at Seeker's Guidance. So the science of Islamic beliefs, right, is in that this work is a level four text, right? The science of beliefs is defined by the ulama as being عِلْمٌ يُقْتَدَرُ بِهِ عَلَىٰ إِثْبَاتِ الْعَقَائِدِ الدِّينِيَةِ مِنْ أَدِلَّتِهَا التَّفْصِيلِيَةِ مَعْ مَعْرِفَةِ الْعَقَائِدِ الْإِيمَانِيَةِ بِوُضُوحٍ وَتَنْمِيَةِ الْيَقِينِ right? So it is a science that enables one to affirm religious beliefs. Right? Religious beliefs meaning the beliefs that are transmitted to us through the Qur'an and the clear sunnah of our beloved messenger وسلم, through decisive proofs. So, aqidah is meant to give us the beliefs but also to, to be able to prove them, um, to defend them and to know the details that are established with clarity that also dispels the innovations of the innovators etc and to clarify you know to clarify that and to cultivate certitude because ultimately you know the the purpose of aqidah um, is both inward facing and outward facing right so so that is um, um, that is the subject matter here. It is important to appreciate that any proper study of the Islamic sciences is built upon graduated study, gradual studying. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the noble Quran regarding this reality that kunu rabbaniyin, be lordly scholars, right? be lordly 
scholars, be lordly people of knowledge. And the, the lordly person of knowledge is one, is someone who seeks knowledge in slavehood to Allah to cultivate their relationship with their Lord, to fulfill the duties of their slavehood to Allah at the personal level and in fulfilling one's public responsibility as a believer out of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is that subtle reality of what is to be a lordly scholar. right? And we've looked at a number of the explanations of what is a lordly scholar. This is referred to in the Qur'an as well as الرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ Those who are firm-footed in knowledge. And we'll share a resource here um, on... Um, from a beautiful work on the way of knowledge, the way of knowledge, guidance, and calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by one of the great giants of Islamic scholarship of our times, Habib Zain ibn Sumayt, which looks at this, right? What, what is a lordly scholar, right? What is, what is or who is a lordly scholar? But then there is a practical aspect of being a lordly scholar, right? or lordly person of knowledge, which is a scholar or the student of knowledge, which is that Al-Alimur Rabbani Man Allam Al-Nasa Sigar Al-Ilmi Qabla Kibarihi That the lordly scholar is the one who teaches people small knowledge before large knowledge. And from that we can also take that the lordly seeker of knowledge is the one who seeks small knowledge before large knowledge. And how does one do that? One goes step by step. So if we look at this notion of graduated purposeful study, we would approach this in a step-by-step fashion. That one would begin with covering something at level one. And, and there, in the Islamic Studies curriculum, we have the Kharid al bahiya of Iam al-Dardir or other equivalent texts, which is a basic metan. We study it, we understand it, and for the serious student of knowledge, they would also memorize both the text and they should be able to explain the core concepts precisely. Then you have level two, right? Here, the foundations, you broaden your understanding, right? And there, for example, we have the, the Sanusiya. Umm al-Barahin of Imam al-Sanusi itself, or the commentary on the Kharida, or Imam Sawi on Johorat al-Tawheed, for example, which is a much easier commentary on the Johara. Then you have level three, which now broadens one's understanding of the issues, of the proofs, etc. And just last term, we looked at Imam Bajuri's Hashia on the Sanusiya. Right? And Sharh al-Sawi can be considered a level 2 text or a level 3. And someone could possibly jump from level 1 to level 3, but it's best to go step by step. Another of the important concepts that is emphasized, uh, but that is coming, but keep it in, keep it in mind, that the ulama talked about al-mabadi'ul ashara, the 10 fundamental investigations related to any subject. Right? And this is coming up in the text, right? That what is the subject, what is its name, what is its basis, what is its purpose, what are its subjects, what it relates to, um, what are its desired outcomes, etc. And these give clarity in any science. But if you've previously, previously studied Aqidah, this has come up in previous texts as well. And one of the things that the student knowledge does as they go ahead is that they consolidate what they took before. They consolidate what they took before. Here, the text that we have at hand, the Johorat al-Tawheed, right, is widely considered one of the most important of the later works of later mutun in Aqidah. And there are several reasons why it is important, right? One is because it summarizes the key investigations of Aqidah in 140 lines. Right? Um, so it covers 
the core Islamic beliefs, but also it gives very important nuances with clarity and precision, right? So that's very important, right? It covers the core beliefs, but um, while having clarity and eloquence, it also has precision. And this is one of the important things that distinguishes it, right? It gives you key mafatih. It gives you keys by which you can really understand and have firm-footedness in the subject of aqidah. So to just cite one example, there's a lot of discussion about um, the issue of beholding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and he summarizes the whole thing. وَمِنْهُ أَنْ يُنْذَرَ بِالْأَبْصَارِ And of what is possible with respect to Allah is that he be beheld by sight. The immediate objection of certain r rationalist sects is that this would entail directionality, Allah being encompassed, therefore God being limited, which is absurd. So he summarized that. ومن هو يزارا بالأبصاري لكن بلا كيف ولا انحصاري. However, without modality and without um, encompassing, right? So that is very powerful, right? Because in a brief, clear way, he addresses the issue. Another example is when we come to the issue of knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a common confusion that knowledge is acquired. There's the known, there's the act of knowing, and then you have knowledge. So this is a question that philosophers and those who think, which is a rare thing with amongst human beings, but it is a potential that people have, right? Um, and it's a mercy that most people don't think, because if they did, more people would be more confused. So unawareness is a bit of a mercy as well. So he summarizes it, وَعِلْمُهُ وَلَا يُقَالُ مكتسب. And Allah's knowledge and we do not say that it is acquired, right? So it seems very simple, right? But this addresses a great theological, philosophical issue underlying it. But that's also why it is very easy to look at the Jawhara, Jawhara al Tawheed. The Jawhara al Tawheed, you can cover it at, as a level one text. Just at, and some people do. Right? Some people prefer teaching the Johara as the first text rather than teaching the Kharid al Bahiyya, for example. And that's just a matter of choice because you can cover it, just unpack the text itself. But it is full of these nuances. It is full of these nuances. So, this is one of the important things that distinguishes this beautiful text that it has these nuances. That's why. Um, and partly, this arises out of the great brilliance of the author, which we will talk about um, after we look at the text itself. As a result of these characteristics, this combination of clarity, but also of nuance. And there is more than enough nuance in the text, right? There's more than enough nuance in the text. That after writing this 140-line text, the author himself felt a need to comment upon it. So he wrote two full commentaries and another one. Um, <coughs> so the author, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Imam Ibrahim Al-Laqani, decided to write a text that unpacks the, uh, the text fully. So he wrote a, a commentary called Umdatul Murid, The Reliance of the Seeker. And it's over 2,400 pages. Right? And that should give one a sense of the depth of the meanings latent within the text. That is it, is it clear and simple? Yes. But is it nuanced and deep? Yes. 
because those nuances he mentions underlying them is not just what is the position of Ahl Sunnah but also a whole host of variant positions as well whether within Ahl Sunnah between the Ash'ira and the Sa'd al maturidiyya may Allah be well pleased with them both but also with divergent groups such as the um, the Mu'tazila and others So, so this is a large text. But then he summarized it somewhat as well in a mid-sized commentary called Hidayatul Murid, which is published also in slightly over a thousand pages. There's a couple of editions. Again, not a short work. His son wrote two commentaries on it, the most important of which is a work called Ithaful Murid. Right? Ithaful Murid. A, a gifting to the seeker, right? It half giving a tuhfa, right? And this work has several hawashi on it. The Hashiyat al Amir, which is the most famous and prob- one of the very important references, as we'll mention later. There's also very important, very beneficial notes by Sheikh Muhyiddin Abdul Hamid, whom some of you will be familiar with from a tuhfa saniya and the excellent. Uh, editions and annotations on the works of grammar and many many other fields right? and he was a remarkable 20th century scholar and who wrote highly beneficial texts not only in Nahu Sarf Balagha but also in Mantiq Adab al-Bahth wal munadhara many many other subjects so that is those are a few of those are the earliest commentaries are the commentaries by the author himself and his son his son has another commentary which is which is brief and is published in a collection of commentaries that is particularly mediocre as an addition amongst the other commentaries and there are many is what we covered as a level two level three text the commentary of imam ahmed asawi and this has the benefit of being clear clear despite precision and it connects issues consistently to spirituality shows that bridge between the knowledge of belief and the realization of certitude um, and then of course of the most important of the commentaries is this particular work Imam Bajuri's Tuhfat al-Murid that we'll be uh, looking at and Imam Bajuri's work this work like others is noted for its nuance its details and it is authoritative Imam Bajuri consistently gives you the tahqiq on an issue you want a precise clear nuanced definition on anything the ulama would mention that consistently of course the, the student of knowledge would know multiple definitions for anything a simple definition a nuanced definition a clear definition there's not one definition for anything right because definitions التعريفوا بمقاصدها Definitions are by the aim of the definition, right? And the student of knowledge should be able to d- explain something to a young child and also to explain something to, um, you know, the, the Ash'ari should be able to define something in a way that the Maturidi wouldn't object or to set the boundaries with those we differ with, whether within Ahl Sunnah or outside. And you know, the art of defining. And that's something that you know, everybody should be working on their practical logic, not just theoretical logic. There are numerous other teaching commentaries. We won't go into a whole list. You can see that in studies on Jehorat al-Tawheed. But there are a number of very beneficial contemporary commentaries as well. Um, amongst them, uh, Sheikh Abdul Karim Tatan's brilliant work, Aun al-Murid. And this is a large work. It's 1400, 1500 pages and has many excellent relevant uh, investigations a lot of the issues that arise in our times that some of our literalist, attitudinally divergent brethren object to or um, so it is very beneficial at that level, he has excellent investigations on those things from a range of very useful sources um, and it's an easy read, it's not, it's 1500 pages but it's not it's not complex 
um, and it's exceedingly beneficial. Sheikh Abdul Karim Tatan is one of the great living masters of our time, and he, mashallah, is you know is is still very much in the alive, and he's one of the, also he frequently connects these. It's 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 a scholarly work, but it uh, connects things to the spirituality as well. He frequently quotes the Hikam and other such works. Now, of all these works, what we've learned from our teachers, uh, you know, is like what Sheikh Adib Kallas rahimahullah ta'ala said on Imam al-Bajuri, that you know, he would say, Imam al-Bajuri muhaqqiqu aqeedati ahli sunnah. Right? Uh, so uh, you know, the great Sheikh Adib Kallas of Damascus rahimahullah ta'ala would often state this, that Imam al-Bajuri is a verifier of the beliefs of ahli sunnah. And many others state similarly. Of course, as a small point, um, if you Google around, sometimes you can find lessons of different shiuch, but lessons are taught according to the to the audience. So there's a, a set of lessons of, of uh, Sheikh Adib Kallas on Tuhfat al-Murid, and they're very Mubarak lessons, but those lessons were recorded in Damascus at a general class. I believe it was held in someone's house. So it was like a family, sort of an extended family and neighborhood circle. Right? Of people who are not really students of knowledge, so it's not meant to be a dars tahqiqi. It was just, it was reading for concerned Muslims, right? So it's a different purpose. But of course, there's, you know, the, there, there's great benefit to that uh, without doubt. Um, Sheikh Adib's great student, Sheikh Hassan al-Hindi, has very beneficial lessons on uh, on Tuhfat al-Murid as well, and on several other commentaries on the Jawhara. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect and preserve him as well. And by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it covered Hashit al-Bajuri uh, on, yani on the Jawhara, Tuhfat al-Murid, with Sheikh Adib Kallas completely. And, par- and partially with Sheikh Hassan uh, in, in person as well. So that's just a little bit about the text. The author, uh, as we will see, um, you can read in the commentary of Imam Asawi a little bit of the context of why the author, Imam Al-Laqani, wrote it. Um, he had a sheikh in the spiritual path, and his sheikh told him to compile a metan that fellow seekers the, you know, would memorize because true spirituality has two components right it's it's the knowledge of of belief realized experientially and the practice of the deen operationalized at at the standards of taqwa right الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَكَانُوا يَتَّقُونَ The two, com- two components of being of the elect servants of Allah. تَحْقِيقُ الْإِمَانِ wa وَتَحْقِيقُ التَّقْوَى right? The realization of faith. So it's the points of faith beheld. And one submission to Allah at the standard of taqwa. Right? Outward and inward. So, this it is said that he completed Imam Al Laqani completed the text in one night. He wrote the text, and they made copies for the students the same night, right? Because you know the Al Aslu fil Khair, Taajiluhu. The basis of anything good is one hastens to do it, right? Ihris ala ma yinfaq. Be avid for for that which benefits, right? Um, and that's why, and generally the um, as there's a there's a poem by Imam Abdullah bin Alawi al Haddad that rhymes with B. Wasiyati laka ya al fadli wal adabi in shi'ta and tarqa al ali min al rutabi. It's a famous poem of counsel with the letter B. Al wasiyah al baiya of Imam. 
Al Haddad and one of his students wrote a great uh, commentary on it from Al Sumayt, and he mentions that you know that, that wasiyah or nasiha arises from the fount of prophethood, right? And this is something that Imam Al Ghazali mentions in the opening of Ayyuh Al Walad, which should be a text that we repeat again and again. So, but he was asked to do this because Imam uh, Laqani was a very significant scholar. So, just a brief note on Imam Laqani and Imam Bajuri. Right? And in, in our edition, you can see the background biographical details. We want to look at some of the key concepts. Now, it is on you to know the birth and death of Imam al laqani and some biographical details. At this level, this is something that we expect the student to pay a little bit of attention to. Um, Imam al laqani was a, was a distinguished Maliki jurist. He was also noted as an expert in the science of hadith. Imam Laqani wrote a super commentary on Nukhbat <coughs> al-Fikr in Ilm al-Hadith, and it's extensive. Um, he also, of course, as relevant to our te text here, was a noted theologian. He didn't just write a summary text, Johrat al-Tawheed, but if you look at Umdat al-Murid, for example, the larger commentary, you see that he is someone who has Sa'atu tila and tamakkun. He has vast encyclopedic knowledge of the science of aqidah and is firm-footed. If you compare sort of the authority and clarity by which he writes in Umdat al-Murid, for example, vis-a-vis -vis many others of the noted later scholars as they approach issues, you see a clarity of reasoning, thinking, and elucidation in Imam al laqani that is highly impressive. And there is both the barakah and light of his spiritual connection as well, right? as we mentioned. And you can see the details, who was his shaykh, etc., in the, you know, in, in the biographies and why he wrote this book. And this is one of the uh, general uh, aspects that seekers of knowledge don't have. You know, they have token ascription to teachers, but they're not students, right? In the sense that uh, you need the, the Prophet ﷺ referred to, to it that the al-alimu wal mutallimu shuraka'u fil khair. Right? That the scholar or the teacher, right? Al alim man yu'allim. Right? So this, it's, the alim is the teacher. Wal mutallim. The learner, right? The teacher and the learner are partners in the good. The rest of the hadith, as for others, there's no good in them. Right? In true terms, right? That the true good that is sought, the, the good, this is the. Um, in kamal al khair is mafqood fi ghayr al alim al mutallim and the completion of good is lacking in others because man yurid illahu bi khairan yufaqihu fi din whomever allah wishes well for he grants deep understanding of religion but it's a partnership but a partnership a sh sh sharika there is a relationship of mutual concern of mutual trust that each person is has nush there are rules of partnership. And if you studied even basic fiqh, you'd know that sharaka is an amana, it's a trust. Right? There's a mutual there. But also the mutallim, and it behooves us to always go back to the foundational principles that the seeker is guided in their seeking by their teachers. Right? Is guided in their seeking by their teachers, which is rarely the case. Most people just uphold enough adab so the teachers do what they want them to do and, and they have a very utilitarian approach to talab al-ilm, which is why, as Imam Zarnuji mentions in the Muqaddima of Ta'alim al-Mut'allim, Imam al-Ghazali mentions in the Adab al-Mut'allim, in the Ihya, um, 
ابن جماعة منشنز ان تذكرة السامع والمتكلم او الاداب العالم والمتعلم or that the imams of the spiritual path mention انما حرم الوصول they're prevented from ever attaining لتضعيعهم الوصول because they squandered the foundational principles وتركهم الاختداء بدليل and they left following a guide and the guide on the path of knowledge are one's teachers that who how did you choose this okay most students frankly are just self-directed right they don't have um right and so that's so that's just a little bit about imam ibrahim al-laqani and you can and it's important to to know these things you should know his birth his death and some of the who some of his teachers were some of his students you can get that from um um the work from the edition of tuhfat al-murid that we recommended and also the other works that we've pointed to same thing with imam al-bajuri it's on you to, to to note his birth and death and these things that that any te- any scholar that you study if you don't know these things then w- what are you doing on this on the path of knowledge imam al-bajuri was an was sheikh was he was known as sheikh al- Islam. He was Sheikh Al-Azhar when that really meant something truly. Um, he was a master of you know, he was a master across the major disciplines of Islam. And it is amazing that in pretty much every subject that he wrote, his works are authoritative in that subject. Subject by subject. right? So he wrote in fiqh and in shafi fiqh, his Hashia on Sharh ibn Qasim, right? On uh, on Matn Abi Shuja is one of the most important works of Shafi'i Fiqh. It's one of the best summarized recensions of Shafi'i Fiqh. Brilliant. Um, this work, uh, you know, Tuhfat al Murid. Um, likewise, his if you want precision as uh, the most precise work on. Uh, the Sanusiya, um, it is Hashit al Bajuri on the Sanusiya. Um, there's some students who we sent to Sheikh uh, Hassan al Hindi to study the commentary of the author on Umm al Barahin. And they mentioned that they studied Hashit al Bajuri. He said, What's the point of studying the author's commentary? If you've understood Hashit al Bajuri, Hashit al Bajuri a'la bi kathir wa adaq. من حاش من شرح المؤلف رحمه الله. Right? said that the Hashif and Bajuri is is much higher in level and much more precise. And then he said على جلالة قدري. Despite the high rank of Imam Sanusi, that's undeniable. I had to intervene as a Sayyidi, but do teach them because you know there's many things in the commentary, etc. And many many other works. Um, Imam Bajuri wrote on the Shama'il, his Hashia on the Shama'il is arguably the most, if you're going to refer to only one text as a student of knowledge on the Shama'il, the most beneficial work is the Hashia of um, the Hashia of Imam al-Bajuri. And of course, la, they say, لا يغني كتاب عن كتاب. No work is sufficiency from other works. Every work has things that other works don't have. But it is exceptionally beneficial and especially this characteristic of precision because Imam Bajuri anything he wrote on he built on the backs of the giants he relied on the major works and when he summarizes an issue but to appreciate Imam al-Bajuri if you take half a dozen other works on the same subject it's like he is arbitrating and adjudicating and reconcile and mediating between what those before him have said Right? But without, with authority, but without attitude. Like with great humility, sometimes you don't realize what's going on unless you put in a little bit of effort. Likewise, his commentary on the Burda. If you look at, and there are dozens of great scholarly commentaries on the Burda. I have probably 25 plus commentaries without trying to gather them on the Burda. If you had to just refer to one commentary that hits 
the issues on the head. It says, despite there being amazing commentaries on the Burda. And likewise, in many other subjects, he has a hashia on the Sulam, al munawraq It is the most precise of the works on the Sulam. Imam al-Sanusi himself wrote a, a strangely neglected mukhtasar in Mantiq. And it's above the level of Isa Ghuji, etc. as a metan. It has many valuable nuances. It is between Isa Ghuji and Tahdib al-Mantiq and so on. But it has many nuances that Tahdib al-Mantiq doesn't have of Taftazani. And As-Sanusi himself wrote a commentary on his Mukhtasar in Mantiq. And who has a hashia on that work? Imam al-Bajuri. If you want one of the most precise and valuable commentaries on the Ajrumiyyah, Imam al-Bajuri wrote a hashia called Fathu Rabb al-Bariyya ala Nazm al-Ajrumiyyah. Uh, he wrote a hashia on al-Imriti's versification of the Ajrumiyyah, which even if you don't memorize the, the Nazm, it is invaluable because al-Imriti on the Ajrumiyyah as he says himself in, in the poem, فَجَاءَ مِثْلَ الشَّرْحِ لِلْكِتَابِ That the, the, the poem version of, you know, the, you know, the, of the Ajrumiya has come like a commentary on the text. Because he added many nuances, addressed some of the issues that the commentators and others have raised on some of the investigations in the Ajrumiya. Um, where th- something else is more precise, when certain details need to be added, etc. And Imam al-Bajuri shows his brilliance in his commentary there. And many, many other works, right? In inheritance law, etc. Right? And exceptionally uh, well-rounded as a scholar, rahimahullah um, ta'ala. <clears throat> And there is a biog- published biography in English of Imam al-Bajuri um, by Dr. Haru- Dr. Harun Spavek, for those curious. Um, and then the third thing that we wanted to look at is the aims, the, the maqasid al-dars, wa wasail al-intifa. Some of the aims of this class and how to benefit as well. Right? Um, so, the first thing to be clear about is that this is a level four uh, text in Islamic beliefs. Again, we're not asking people to leave or anything, but for most people, like, yani, تثبيت الأساس أهم من سرعة البناء That making the foundation firm is more important than building quickly. Right? Um, because if, yani, أصلها ثابت وفرعها في السماء It's as... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the shajara tayyiba, the good tree. Its roots are firm and its branches are in the sky. And that's almost like a conditional statement. right? It's akin to a conditional statement. I.e. In kana far'uha thabitan fa far'uha fis sama. If its foundations are firm, then and only then will its branches be in the sky. Right? Which is why the ulama say, "Man atqan al mutun nal al funun." Whoever masters with precision the core texts attains the sciences. Woman qara al hawashi, fama hawashi, and whoever reads just the big books without that foundation doesn't attain anything. But if you have that precise core understanding, then you can navigate the large text with clarity and without confusion. So they, some people say the big books are so confusing. Yeah, they're confusing because you don't know where you are. Right? They say the desert is either a place for, for destruction or where great journeys are accomplished. Right? Because to go a long distance, you have to cut through the deserts and the plains and the valleys and the mountains. But if you know where you're going and how to get there, then and you're ready for the journey, then all of it's p- part of a bigger trajectory. So there are five key aims at, at this level. And many of them are common to earlier 
levels. One is that here we're seeking to deepen our understanding of the core investigations of Islamic beliefs, right? And part of deepening the understanding is that consolidate what you've already taken. Consolidate what you've already taken. Knowledge, if knowledge is a journey, then studying is like being on a caravan, right? You have to shepherd the whole caravan. So as you're studying this text, you're accompanying with you Hashit al-Bajuri on the Sanusiya. You're accompanying with you Sawi on the Johara, Sharh al-Kharida, al-Iqtisad fil i'tiqad if you've studied it. You're accompanying with you um, book two of, of the Ihya, Qawa'id al-Aqaid, which we also have at Seekers. You're accompanying with you the Kharida al-Bahiyya if you've studied the Tahawiyya, whatever else you've studied. Even if it be in a small, intensive, whatever, because sometimes you find mafatih. You may also find that some teachers made some choices that would raise questions. Of course, the other is not to say Sheikh so and so said this, but you know. But you may also find some value, amazingly valuable insights that, in attending that program with Dr. Omar Farooq Abdullah, you didn't realize how valuable an insight that was, or you took a class with. Sheikh Ahmed Hussein Al Azhari in um, Sharh Al Aqaid, or with Sheikh Hamza Karam Ali, or whoever. Right? These are you accompany these texts with you, right? You know, investigation by investigation. So you consolidate. That's part of deepening understanding. You're not jumping in the pool for the first time. Secondly, you want to now have clarity and confidence regarding the nuances of the subject, the critical investigations in the subject, right? The nuances and related to that familiarity with this critical investigations. And one of the aspects of this is to know where to find issues in the text. And that's what's called madhanul masail. That we want to cultivate knowing where you can find the key issues. That okay, of course you want to come out knowing Bajuri on the Johara, right? With clarity, you could teach the text itself or through knowledge of what you've covered, you could teach the metan itself without requiring metan or the sharh. That if you sat down at the Islamic center and suddenly a youth group came, smart youth, um, and they asked you 50 questions. You can answer the 50 questions precisely. That if they went back and their, their youth from down the road from Sheikh Amin Muhammad in Jersey, in Atlantic City, New, New Jersey. And they, they sent you, they sent, he sent them to you. But if they went back to Sheikh Amin, who knows what he's talking about in Aqidah, and they told him your answers, he wouldn't have to say, oh, but that's not quite precise, etc. Why? Because you, because you conveyed it with precision. Right? So familiarity with the critical investigations and and awareness of the key reference works. These are interrelated. So you know where to find details, both on the Johara and elsewhere. Uh, and then critically, the ability to explain, teach, transmit, and affirm the, the core aqaid of Ahl sunnah To be able to do so, there are some key reference works that we will be consistently referring to, specifically and more broadly, one is, of course, of the key references are the commentaries on the Johara. One is, as a brief, clear commentary, you have Ithaf al-Murid of Ibn al-Nadhim, of the son of the author, Abd al-Salam al-Laqani, with the two Hawashi, Hashit al-Amir and Sheikh Muhyiddin Abdul Hamid, his commentary, which is very good in clarifying issues. The author's large work, Umdat al-Murid, which we talked about, and it's brilliant in its depth and breadth and background. And if you want to, to know details that, okay, what exactly did the Mu'tazila say? And why do the later scholars don't gi not, not give nuances? Right? right? And usually, you need the, it is the lazy seeker who objects. They say, oh, they don't explain the positions of the Mu'tazila faithfully. Yes, because you only read the summaries. Right? Bajuri on the Johara is a summarized work. It is about 
four or five times, maybe six times smaller than the author's Umdat al-Murid. It's a summary text. It gives you the conclusions and brief explanation of why. Right? It's an index of issues and key reasoning. It doesn't go into nuance, not about the Ash'ari position, let alone about the other positions, except fleetingly. Right? So there are many works, but a very useful starting point. And he, he of course, references where he gets his um, you know, positions from, and that's a very valuable work. Sheikh Abdul Karim Tatan's Aoun al Murid, and we'll share the PDF of each of these works, uh, inshallah, in the recommended resources for the course. Sid Abdul Latif will be putting that up. Um, so that's very, very useful as well. And we've talked a little bit about it, right? And, you know, especially because many relevant contemporary discussions are there on some of the issues about literalism and so on, but um, many other issues. That's one. One source. Another thing, of course, that we'll be pointing to is key mabahith. Right? We'll be pointing to because the student of knowledge needs to know <coughs> where they can find reliable discussions on critical issues. Right? And one of the things that, one of the questions you should always ask teachers is ma, ma afdalu ma ullifa fi kada wa kada. What's the best thing written on such and such? Because while, just as they are, general works in any subject, there are specific treatises on pretty much everything. Now, as a student of knowledge, your fard is to know the core texts. But you need to start dipping into some of these texts. So we'll see, for example, in the opening, there are m many treatises on the Basmala. And there are people who've, who, whose hair has grayed, and they've been teaching for a, dec for a decade, 20 years. And you say, okay... Sayyidi, what's the best thing you've read on the Basmala? So all, they all have the same thing. And without trying to expand on the subject, there are at least half a dozen highly significant treatises on the meanings of the Basmala. Treatises, let alone the books of Tafsir, so many of the later commentaries, and they're not repetitive. The ulama summarized, so oh, God knows where they came up with this from. Yeah, God knows, and people of knowledge know, but you're lazy, you don't bother looking it up. Right? They say, oh, they just, came, they just all agreed on this. But if you actually bother looking where they came up to these conclusions about what's the relationship between the hamdala and shukr, between alhamdulillah and shukr, etc. That's, you know, so there are treatises. What's the best treatise on tawassul? Because it comes up, it comes up in the commentary. So these are things, and some of those, of course, you may well not be able to read everything that we share with you, but to be guided as to madhanul masail, where you find issues. So we'll be sharing some of that. Don't let that busy you from the core duty to understand the text itself clearly. Then there are key references that we will be pointing you towards and referring to regularly. And, you know, istighrab, just mentioning many, many sources is blameworthy, whether for the teacher or the student. But there are some references that are particularly important. And we, you know, there's a few that we will focus on uh, referring to. One is Imam Ghazali's Al-Iqtisad fil I'tiqad. Imam Ghazali's Al-Iqtisad, which is also translated into English as moderation in belief. It's a decent translation um, and beneficial. He wrote this as, this is enough for other than the specialist. Whether the educated Muslim or the seeker of knowledge, this is, Al-Iqtisad is the balanced sufficient amount, right? It's the right balanced amount. This is the right required balance. It's very beneficial, especially because Imam al-Ghazali is one of the great eloquent writers of Islamic scholarship, right? right? Yani some of the ulama have written that they are, that if balagha, if eloquence is 
um, for words to correspond with the context in which they're expressed, then in Islamic scholarship, there are a number, some mention four, six of the most eloquent writers. One of them is Imam al-Ghazali. And he is disarmingly clear in his expressions. Right? So this is a very useful work. Right? Now, he is no, there's no such thing as the last word on anything. That's the nature of knowledge. But Imam al-Ghazali sees concepts with dazzling clarity. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Right? And often he's explaining from a different angle than many of the other later scholars. So it's very refreshing and beneficial uh, to refer to. Right? Especially on key concepts, it's very beneficial. And we'll be pointing to some of them. We did that as well in Bajuri on the Sanusiya. And the idea is to consolidate. Um, second, of course, is the commentaries on Ummul Barahin. Especially when we come to the proofs, etc., it is highly beneficial. And if you studied Bajuri and the Sanusiya, you can go back because you will notice that there's less of an emphasis on the proofs in Jawharat al Tawheed. In the Metin itself, it doesn't really come up. Bajuri, Imam al Bajuri on Tuhf al mentions the proofs, but in summary, the serious student of knowledge would use their pre prior study of Ummul Barahin and its commentaries to consolidate what they cover here. Especially Bajuri, also Imam Dasuqi, right? Particularly on the area of proofs. Thirdly, Ibn Arafaz, Mukhtasar al Kalami. And, we'll, and we will share this, bi'nilai ta'ala. A Mukhtasar does not mean a short work, a Mukhtasar is a summation. A summary can be brief, mid sized, or large. And the Mukhtasar al Kalami of Ibn Arafah, who is one of the great late Malikis and a precursor, um, just one generation removed to Imam Sanusi and one of the great influences on him, is over 1200. It summarizes the position and arguments within the Ash'ari school, particularly, and some discussion of some of the uh, yeah, external groups. Brilliant. And if, you're, if you really want to know Okay, what did the theologians say about this? Right? Because the later teaching texts sometimes follow one key strand of argument because they found that that's the strongest, etc. But you want to see, oh, what are other arguments? It summarizes them and it references them from the great scholars. Um, Al-Baqillani, Al-Juwaini, Al-Ghazali, Al-Razi, Al-Amidi, Al-Taftazani, Al-Jurjani, all these great, you know, th these great giants. Right, so it's you know it's a work, not something that you necessarily go to consistently. But if you re if you do want to unpack things, then once in a while we will point out some of the useful investigations. Then there's this work that's a very useful work, though it has some limitations, which is Sajikli Zada's Nashrut Tawalia. Right, it um, Sajikli Zada took Tawali al Anwar of Al Baydawi, which is a very important work in Ilm al Kalam. Which, is, which has some of the very, a number of great commentaries on it, particularly uh, Imam Al Asfahani's Matali'ul Anzar, Sharh Tawali'ul Anwar. But Imam Al Baydawi, because he is presenting Sunni theology and defending it w w against. The, rash, you know, the, the rationalist extremes like the Mu'tazila, but also the Falasifa and others. Some of the investigations there were, were argued by most of the later scholars were unnecessary. So Sajiq Lizada omits some of these very theoretical and th philosophical investigations that weren't directly needed as a support for theology. But he also brings in a lot that is extremely beneficial from Taftazani's Sharh al Maqasid and Al Jurjani's Sharh al Mawaqif. Taftazani wrote a work called Al Maqasid, just a brilliant summation of Ilm al Kalam, and he wrote an expansive commentary published in five, six volumes on it, one of the great references for Ash'ari Aqidah. And if you want to know the position of Yama Taftazani on it, 
look for it in Sharh al Maqasid, not in Sharh al Aqaid, where he, you know the primary role he's doing there is explaining Maturidi Aqida. And then he brings in his arguments here and there uh, to much confusion or consternation among some Maturidis. Uh, but and sh- uh, uh, Al-Jurjani's Sharh al-Mawaqif is a commentary on the Mawaqif of Imam Adwududdin al-Iji, who's a common teacher to both of them. So Sajiq Lizada adds a lot that is of great benefit from these two works. But Sajiq Lizada's Nashr al has its limitations. He is a good commentator, summarizer, etc. He is not an authority. He's not an authority in Ilm al-Kalam. Right? And here, Sajiq Lizad has a number of other treatises, those of you who are uh, uh, in a, uh, SOPs, search-oriented persons, you can find several treatises by Sajiq Lizad and Kalam. They're good summations of what others have said, and some of them are useful, but he is not a, you know, but he is not at the level of the muhaqqiqeen like some of the others we've mentioned here. Um, then there's a great dictionary of the terminology of the Islamic sciences. Alama Tahanawis, Kashaf Istilahat al Funun, and that in the issues related to Aqaid is brilliant. And generally, he relies on Sharh al Maqasid, Sharh al Mawaqif, uh, the commentaries on Sharh al Aqaid, etc. And it is extremely beneficial. Now, he also goes extensively into what the falasifa have said. You have to be a little bit selective in looking at Kashaf Salahat al and don't get lost. Everyone knows their level and their capacity, but it is, um, you know, we'll be referring to it um, on and off as well. Because it's one of the things that one should become familiar with and comfortable with. And then there are, there's Sharh al Aqaid al Nasafiyya. Of uh, Imam Taftazani with the key super commentaries on it, arguably uh, the most important being Al Nibras of Mawana Farhari, Kastali, Fanari, etc. But don't get lost in the Hawashi. Right? Your focus is Bajuri on the Johara. There's enough there, but this is some of what's, you know, an arsenal that you should be aware that is there and you know, we'll be sharing some things here and there from these works. Also stay focused. There's a lot of ilmi noise going around. Be selective with your attention as well. Um, then, of course, there, there is another school of, Asha, of Ahl Sunnah Aqidah, which is the Maturidis. We are not here to explain Maturidi Aqidah, but at an intermediate level, one needs to be aware of some of where one can find key issues of the Maturidi school. We're not talking here to be very clear about what is a curriculum of study of Maturidi Aqidah, right? but rather what are some clear, reliable, authoritative references to be able to look up issues in Maturidi Aqidah. And briefly, we can mention three. One is, if there's one work that you want an unpacking of, Ash'ari of Maturidi Aqidah is Abu Mu'in al-Nasafi's Tabsiratul Adilla. It is extensive, expansive, and brilliant. And it's, you know, he is an early 6th century, from the early 500s, um, author. Of course, there are great Nasafis in the, in the Hanafi, Maturidi school. There's Abu Hafsa al-Nasafi, the author of the Aqaid al-Nasafiyya, and Manzumat al-Khilaf, great Hanafi jurist as well. Then you have Abu Mu'in al-Nasafi, you have Hafiz al-Din al-Nasafi, and other Nasafis as well, but these are the three most important theological Nasafis, right? Abu Hafs al-Nasafi, author of, Sharh of the Matn al-Aqaid al-Nasafiya, you have Hafiz al-Din al-Nasafi, who authored Umdat al- uh, Umdat al- uh, يعني Umdat al-Aqaid, um, which he commented upon, Al-I'timad fi al-I'tiqad, um, and Abu and so Abu Hafs uh, Abu Hafs al Nasafi Abu Mu'in al Nasafi were both sixth century, and then late 
7th century. He died early 8th century, 706 or 710. Some say 711. Abu, Abu al-Barakat uh, al-Nasafi, who was the author of what's famous as Tafsir al-Nasafi, although there's at least four great Tafsir by Nasafis. Um, Nasaf was a small town that produced a lot of great scholars. Um, and then, um, so that's a large reference, generally published in two volumes. Then there is a beautiful summary um, by Ibn Shihna called Manzumat al Aqaid, and it's commented upon by Sayyid Ahmad al Hamwi. And this published by Dar al Dar al Fatih. It's called Taliq al Qalaid, Sharh Manzumat al Aqaid. Um, Ibn Shihna, great uh, 8th, 9th century scholar, wrote a 140 line poem in which he joined between Bad'ul Amali of Al Ushi. And Umdat al Itiqad of An Nasafi in a poem. And he says nothing like this has been authored in Maturidi Aqidah. Clear, precise, built on two great mutun in the uh, in Maturidi Aqidah. And Sayyid Ahmad al Hamui wrote a commentary on it called Taliq al Qalaid. Um, and Sayyid Ahmad al Hamui, 11th century scholar, he is a great Hanafi jurist. Very well-rounded alim wrote um, probably the most important commentary on al ashbah wa nadair of Ibn Nujaym in Hanafi fiqh, uh, in the nuances of Hanafi fiqh. Also wrote, he wrote many important treatises, etc. His rasail are available in manuscript form and many of them are published. He wrote many, many important works. He also wrote a commentary on the Nukhba in Mustalah al-Hadith. Very significant scholar, Sayyid Ahmad al-Hamwi. So this is a brilliant, clear uh, reference. You want a, a, a mid-sized summary of what, how did the later Maturidi Aqidah uh, affirm things? This is one of the sources, mid-sized, clear, precise, and has some amazing nuances. Um, so for example, there's a discussion adopted by many late scholars on arguing that the sif that mercy is the meaning of mercy is haqiqi when applied to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And um, and many scholars, great scholars, accepted that at face value. Partly because of the great authority of the person who made this argument, uh, Mullah Ibrahim al Qurani, rahimahullah ta'ala, but Sayyid Ahmad al Hamwi, without mentioning al Qurani, makes clear that <laughs> although he puts it pretty firmly he says uh, is just blackening of the page and wasting of ink <laughs> and he says I do not say this to criticize what he said but rather just to affirm what is more correct so but it, it's a very 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 beneficial work on many things you want to understand issue of Ismat al-Anbiya, etc. Between Ibn Shihna's precision and Al-Hamwi's nuance, but brevity, it's a very beneficial work. Um, and then finally, Imam al-Bayadi, al-Qadi, al-Bayadi has a work, Isharat al-Maram an Ibarat al-Imam. Imam al-Bayadi took the six, I think it's six treatises ascribed to Imam, ascribed to or related from Imam Abu Hanifa, and he turned them into a metan. That these are, Imam, this is a transmission of the positions of Imam Abu Hanifa in Aqidah. And Imam al Bayadi then un explains the issues and unpacks how did the Maturidis explain the key issues of theology and what are the real points of difference between the Ash'aris and Maturidis. It's a brilliant unpacking of the issues, but it can be challenging. It's not, um, it's not a simple work, but it's truly brilliant. Imam, Imam Muhammad Zahid al-Kawthari praises it um, unreservedly. So 
th th that's a little bit of background. Now, th this is the, you know, there's a fard, which is the text, and then there's a nafl, right? Your duty is the fard, right? وَمَا تَقَرَّبْ You know, أَصْلُ التَّقَرُّبْ بِالْفَرْضِ Right? But تَمَامْ الْوُصُولْ بِالْنَفْلِ But one fulfills the journey through the nafl. Right? But one must prioritize. And in that, the Prophet ﷺ said, القصد, القصد تَبْلُهُ Remain purposeful. Remain purposeful and you shall attain. Right? right? Remain purposeful. Have a purpose. Have a plan. And have a consistent process, a habit of study and review. And um, and then not everything can be done at once. Some of the things you're aware, it's there, but you keep track of it. That Okay, these are things that I want to get to, but the seeker of knowledge doesn't let the fawaid pass. There's certain things that you catch at one time and maybe years later that you find it. Right? Sometimes our teachers looked for things that we can find much later. Um, when covering Aqidah with Sheikh Adib, um, I'd often take different expressions of Sheikh Abdul Ghani Nabulsi to seek clarification from him from a theological perspective. And several times he raised that there's a there's a large work of Sheikh Abdul Ghani Nabulsi called Al Matalib al Wafiya, but it's not been published. And if only we could get access to it. Because there's a manuscript, and then in the late 90s, even early 2000s, it was exceedingly difficult to get access to any manuscript. Now the whole thing's available. Right? But of course, one needs to prioritize. That if you've not given the core text its due and the, pri you know, the primary circle of references, the texts that are recommended for a particular thing, you haven't given those things their due, then other things are not a priority. And... Sheikh Muhammad Awama said uh, that um, one of his advices for the seeker of knowledge, very much in spirit of this idea of remaining purposeful, he said that in Kana Imam Malik Yara and the Awala Hadithin Yulakanuhu Talibul Ilm Oluhu Sallallahu Alihi Wasallam Min Husni Islam Il Mari Tarkuhu Mala Yani. That the Imam, it's uh, related that Imam Malik said that the first hadith that a student of knowledge should be taught is, as a student of knowledge is, from the excellence of a person's submission, is leaving all that does not concern them. Right? He's leaving all that does not concern them. Because the Salaf said, Man, man, من اشتغل بما لا يعنيه فاته كثير مما يعنيه Whoever busies themselves with things not of concern to them misses out on much that is of concern to them. Right? Um, so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for assistance and facilitation. Inshallah, next class we will start with the author's introduction and the first investigations. Do write out the method itself and take summarized notes, right? Take summarized notes. Al-ilmu ma baqi. Knowledge is what remains. If you, you know, if you found yourself in Frankfurt for 18 hours and suddenly some students of knowledge showed up and you don't have internet, okay? You don't have internet. They said, we want to come and study with you. Please teach us aqidah. You could teach them Ash'ari aqidah fully, precisely, with clarity, and answer their questions without needing to have a text in front of you. That's 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 ilm, right? There's only two levels of dabt, right? And that of of consequence, right? There's dabt, there's dabt al sadr, is to have precise understanding through retention, and there's dabt al kitab, and it's to know something. But you need to rely on what's written. And that's much lower. But, but you know it. And you just have to refer to confirm. But just say, Dabtul Faham is not Dabt. It's Madhaka. Say, oh, I understand it, but I can't explain it without a text. 
right? That's that's not the standard of of ilm. So may Allah subhanahu wa taala grant us the tawfiq to pursue uh, the way of knowledge with clarity and precision. Um, any questions before we close? Tadul. Memorizing what? There is no. Sh- should one memorize Yohrat of Tawheed? One has to have something memorized in Aqidah. What, what what it is depends on one's circumstances. Um, so one should have at least one text memorized in, in Aqidah. But any. Man wasa'a wasa'a Allahu alayhi. Whoever is more expansive, Allah is more expansive with them. Um, but it's not a requirement, but one needs to know it very clearly. How one knows it clearly, that's a secondary thing. Um, but certainly, having a mental map of the issues, and there's much in the Johara that's not in the Kharida, for example, it's twice the size. And there's much in the Kharida that's not in the Johara. So these are, you know, these are three sort of three very distinct texts that complement each other very powerfully. The Kharida, Umm al Barahin, and the Johara, right? They, they each have uh, elements that are distinct and unique to them. The one who knows all three is precisely is not like the one who just knows one. That's returns to one's himma and what else? What else is a priority? Um, any other que- any questions online, Sadati? Have any questions? You can put your hands up, inshallah. Okay, can you just read it in the mic? But unmute. If we see discrepancy discrepancy between definitions between Imam Sawi and Bejuri. Who do we give precedence to? So, uh, discrepancies in definitions, very often it's a matter of there's different considerations in definitions, right? Um, generally, Imam al Bajuri is more likely to be more precise, but because that's a consideration of his. Whereas, often, um, Imam al Sawi's definition may be simpler, right? Maybe simpler. Imam al Sawi sometimes doesn't actually give a formal definition. He defines something by implication. He explains it, and the explanation is a clear and simple definition. It helps to to know both, like a simple definition, but a nuanced definition. An example of that is when we looked at the attribute of knowledge in Hashid al-Bajuri on the Sanusiya, Imam Bajuri himself mentions there's a superior definition of knowledge, right? Because, because the word inkishaf, uh, in fa'ala, has certain, can have the immediate implication of in, in fa'ala, right? Is something happening, right? So it's, there's a dilala of, there's a, an apparent dilala of huduth. So the issue of, um, you know, of using the word ta'alluq uh, inkishaf, has a downside. So there's a more precise definition that he refers to, and I believe he took it from Al Kamal ibn Abi Sharif. We came up. That's more precise. But the other definition, all you have to put in it is Duna Sabqi Khafa. Because in Kishaf, and as those of you know Arabic, like Ustad Didi, with nuance, in Fa'ala doesn't necessarily Im- imply change. And particularly, all verbs, when they apply to Allah, are disconnected from their contingent considerations, as certainly as they relate to Allah Himself. Because Allah is exalted beyond time and change and all these things. Fa, so, so sometimes it's good to know both the precise thing and the simple thing. And sometimes we just have to see 
that which one is practically more more useful right um Right. So saw is very useful. Sometimes you'll find a definition in Bajuri that is precise, but it's terse. And if you try to use that to explain to someone, it'll go way over their head. So Imam Sawi, etc., are very useful. That sometimes, you know, because clarity is, you know, because our duty is al balaghul mubin to convey with clarity, and sometimes just to understand with clarity. Any other questions, inshallah? The question above Is the imam's name pronounced Bajuri or Bejuri Or is both acceptable? They're both Because <coughs> the Actually Imam Bajuri Refers to himself in both ways as well In his writings right? Um, so is it Bejuri or Bajuri? It, it's all one of those things that It goes back th- th- to the name of the town that he's from How do you derive the nisbah from it? Right? And they actually differ on it. If you look at the commentators, they say, no, the qiyas would be, that should be bejur, so he should be bejuri. But bejuri is arguably the more common, but they're both. It's like a nawawi and a nawawi, or a siyuti and al asyuti. Right? Because it is the, the nisba to a place and one which is more correct. But also, which is more prevalent, and there, there are multiple ways. Like, and that applies to city names in many places. Like, is it Al Asfahani or Isfahani, or Al Asbahani or Al Isbahani? Right? There's at least six ways you can refer to Asbahan or Asfahan or whatever it's called in Farsi. Right? Like, al- is it Al Jilani or Al Jailani or Al Kailani? Or al gailani or just al jili. Right, so there's multiple ways to derive the nisbah. It's referring to the same person. There's a place. There's actually more than one place called Kuhistan. Right, and the nisbah to it in Arabic is either al Kuhistani, but that's a bit heavy in Arabic. So just call it al Kuhistani. So there's multiple ways to do that, and with Turkish names, Farsi is still a li- little closer to, to Arabic, but you see Turkish names, it's even more. Well, one needs just to be aware, that's a little bit messy. Um, and then, Al-Laqani, um, the Sha'i'ah is Al-Laqani with a Shadda, but arguably with Takhfif, Al-Laqani, May, may well be more precise. But again, the issue of precision and what is prevalent, and both are, you know, both are acceptable. It's not one is wrong. Right? There's many things like that, that there's more than one uh, possible derivation with names. Was there any other question? Which edition of Tuqfat al-Murid would you rec- would you recommend that you refer to? Yeah, so um, <coughs> we're we're sharing one edition, which is the Dar Salam edition, um, ascribed to Sh- uh, Sheikh Ali Jumwa. Um, it's a, it's a it's a good edition. Um, I wouldn't say there's any authoritative edition of b- of Tuhfat al Murid that's out there. That's remarkably distinct in its quality, but, but that's a, a, a good enough addition by current standards. Sheikh Abdul uh, Sheikh Abdul Salam Shannar has a good, has a reasonably good addition as well. Sometimes that may be more available. And then uh, Sheikh Muhammad Saleh Al Ghursi has a hashia on Tuhfat al-Murid. And if you like some entertainment, he has loads of objections. But Sheikh al-Wursi's objections, sometimes, or his notes, sometimes they're very beneficial. He has some beautiful nuances. Sometimes it's nitpicking. And sometimes it's just not fair. 
right? And just that just he is he he's a brilliant mind has, has a very critical eye and but it make but you 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 can't just believe every you can't just accept everything that Sheikh Al-Ghursi says at face value. He's challenging you. Right? But you know, if you don't want the challenge just <laughs> ignore what he's saying, right? Just but it's it's very beneficial. And Sheikh Al-Ghursi is one of the great uh living theologians without doubt of our time but he has many uh personal opinions as well but he's a he's a brilliant and highly respected uh, s- uh scholar may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect and preserve him um those of you who have done mantiq before we have some classes in mant- uh, some texts in mantiq taught by him rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi so and he's and he has some very very beneficial work so that's that's a that that's there um i'm not necessarily recommend but i'll be pointing to it once in a while some of his objections do deserve response and sometimes he mentions nuances that are worthy of attention wa barakallahu ta'ala fikum wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam um how did okay just one last question how do you tell what's the best of ed- edition of a book is good to ask is good to ask um, people who are in the know about the subject and people who pay attention to good editions and so on but also don't believe the hype because hype a lot of time hype is just sales afdal tub you know this that a lot of noise but it's like you know it's you know uh you know th- there is not much substance behind it so don't believe advertising number one that's like if someone just buys things on the basis of advertising <laughs> right so you have to keep an uh, ilmi ad blocker with respect to book publications right don't believe the publisher aham sharh ala kada kada who said the guy who published it is saying is the most important commentary who do you you need uh يعني الاصل انه يرجع في كل فن الى اهله the basis is that in every subject we go to its people right so don't buy books because something new has come out okay something new has come out but is this important when you build your library you build according to what you're studying what you will be studying what you need with respect to what you're studying now where you are in your studies what are the reference texts that you need where you are right now Right? right because if you are for example at a you know studying at at a level 3 in the islamic studies curriculum you need commentaries on hadith you don't need fath al-bari for the price of fath al-bari you could buy three four commentaries in hadith all of which you will need and benefit from you know much more and those are our priority right so that's and one should you know one should consult right also get a sense of what are good publishing houses that's general though what are good who are some better editors but in general if you're going to buy a copy of a book strive to yeah, the the aqil and qalilun ma hum how few they are is someone who acts with principle that anything they do is based on a reason why did you buy that edition of a book oh that's what i found well you didn't really look very hard did you right so no you you take the right means and part of being aqil is the art of learning how to take the right means right uh mufti rafi usmani i've heard several of his addresses to graduating students from the madrasa and said look you have not become a alim right now we have just given you the keys to ilm right and that's the student knowledge has some knowledge but then they've acquired the keys to knowledge someone who's studied a full curriculum of, of grammar is not a grammarian they've just they know their core grammar hopefully well and they have the keys to really pursue the journey of becoming a grammarian and it just ask in every subject ask the specialists right 
Like there's a lot of noise about a particular copy of Ihya'ul Mudin. A whole bunch of people buy it. And I've, over the years, asked many people, um, what made you choose that copy? Just the hype. And that's like a hadith that's famous does not mean it's sahih. Shuhratul hadith la yani sihatahu. Hadith being famous does not mean that it's sahih. Right? In Usul al Fiqh, they tell us that la tarjiha bi kathratil riwayah. There's no preponderation just through much narration. All it means is it was narrated a lot. It doesn't mean anything. But the same thing applies with books. Everybody's talking about it. Okay? So it's good. Right? But you see an announcement. Wow! There's a new book by... You know, so some people go, there's an encyclopedia of Hanafi fiqh of Imam al qudi Yes, it's a brilliant work. But if you don't have a, you know, the books that you need right now, what are you doing with Imam Quduri's Tajreed? Right? So that's that's in everything, right? Right. It's like someone who has a small, you know, a small garden, and they hear that the farmers buy the you know buy a particular tractor to cut the grasses on their fields. If you bring that tractor home, could you cut your your, your lawn with it? No, it's too wide for the lawn. It's not the tractor's bad. It's not what you need. Okay. Now, one day when you have a farm, you get the big, the big contraption. Right. فَنَسَلُ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَ تَعَالَى التَّيْسِيرُ وَالْلُطْفِ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ